Hi, I'm Satori Shakur, and here's what's coming up this week on One Detroit Arts and Culture. Detroit punk rock band Cinecide staked their claim as the first punk rockers in the Motor City. Plus, Wynton Marsalis talks about the time he returned to Orchestra Hall with the jazz at the Lincoln Center Orchestra. Then, we catch up with Penny Stamps, Distinguished Speaker Series Director Christina Hamilton. It's all coming up on One Detroit, Arts and Culture. Support for this program provided in part by the Kresge Foundation, the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Gregory Haynes and Richard Soninklar. Nissan Foundation. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Satori Shakur. Welcome to One Detroit, Arts and Culture. I'm coming to you from the Mary Grove Theater. Thank you for being with me. While COVID continues to keep us closer to home these days, the creative community is finding a way for artists and groups to continue to push forward. That's why we created One Detroit Arts and Culture, to keep us in touch with performances, music, and cultural events we love to experience, engage with, and that feeds our souls. Coming up on the show, how dissatisfaction with rock music brought us Detroit punk rock band, Cinecide, and how the do-it-yourself rockers have evolved since the 1970s. Plus, Wynton Marcellus tells us about the Democracy Suite, then director of the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series, Christina Hamilton. And we'll finish with a performance from Detroit's own punk rock pioneers, Cinecide. Detroit has never been shy about its pioneering music scene, and that includes punk rock. So much of this music was self-produced and self-released, yet it rivaled the punk scene in New York and L.A. One of Detroit's first punk bands, Cinecide. They formed in the mid-1970s. They're still making music today and were even nominated for a 2021 Detroit Music Award. We didn't know a lot about Cinecide until our one Detroit editor, Chris Jordan, a punk rock fan in his own right, and who worked with the band, introduced us. Punk rock was really sort of a, um, a dissatisfaction about rock and roll. It became one thing, or it became a, a narrower thing, and it was, um, it, it, was, it was at the exclusion of anything else. Because you were passionate about music, we were passionate about music, uh, you, you got angry. You know, passion, anger, you know, there's punk rock, there you go. Formed in 1976, the same year that the Sex Pistols and the Ramones released their first singles, Cinecide were, depending who you ask, Detroit's first punk band. We thought we were completely alone. You know, Detroit was filled with cover bands, you know, and, um, you know, just doing rock and roll uh, covers. You know, that just wasn't what I was looking for. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a good enough kick. We decided to make a record, Gutless Radio, which is sort of an anthem against radio at the time. As we discovered that there were uh, some other things going on in other parts of the country or, um, or other parts of the world, uh, you would get wind of, you know, some sort of underground band or something, and, you know, there was just no possibility that they would play any of that stuff. I mean, it was sort of... Uh, you know, sort of brash. I mean, most bands in rock and roll would be, uh, 
you know, I want to be signed. I want the industry to love me. In our case, it was, we were, you know, sort of just slamming, slamming the industry with the idea that it would be, you know, we would do it yourself. We would issue our own records and things. They were one of the central bands in what became, by the early 80s, a thriving, eclectic, fiercely independent punk scene in Detroit. All the clubs, and there were a lot of them that were doing punk, um, they were full like every night. It didn't matter who played. In fact, a lot of you know, you know, kids would go to the bars just because they knew something was going to go on there. It was an eclectic scene. So, you know, there was a nice spectrum of bands. It wasn't one thing. It was, you know, it could be bands that were... Uh, very roots oriented or it could be bands that were you know more rock and roll uh, a little electronica you know kind of stuff was sneaking in there but you know it all I seemed to the commonality was you know it had to be uh, a little raw had to have a little bit of an edge 45 years later Cinecide are still going strong are still totally DIY and just released their eighth album with the pulp sci-fi inspired title track vegetable or thin. This is uh, this is a project that we worked on for a while, uh, actually before the pandemic, and then finished it up during the pandemic. Chris Gerard was in the band and played bass with us, and we recorded a lot of that with him in the band, and then he had health troubles, and Chris went on his hiatus, and we always thought that he would end up back in the band, uh, but things did turn for the worse, and um, he died. Just an amazing, amazing guy, a beautiful soul, a uh, great creator. He always had an innovative and interesting way to look at things. Uh, you know, maybe uh, two thirds of the record was, you know, with Chris or something was close to being done, but we kept putting it off and putting it off. We were mixing and things during the COVID thing, so essentially, uh, you know, we just stayed safe and tried to be safe, but I thought we have to release this. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to not release it and we're just going to have to try different things like, um, like, maybe we uh, could do a re-release <laughs> when the bar is open. Could... So being in the independent music scene, the Detroit punk scene, for just about 45 years, how have you seen the scene change and how has your approach to making punk rock changed? You know, I don't know that I can say anything about a scene. I'm always interested in what's going on in Detroit. There's a load of great musicians, load of great people creating and making music and stuff. I mean, it's through all these different eras, through the 80s, 90s, 2000s now, I think that Detroit is sort of underplayed. It, it doesn't get the exposure that it should. Has your approach to writing punk rock changed? Is it still the same sensibility, the same spirit? I mean, Cinecide is Cinecide, and it has a specific kind of sound, but I, I would say we evolve every, every time, every song. To me, punk was just about getting back to our roots, you know, stripping music down and being, uh, well, being fun, yes, being aggressive, it could be, but also, you know, respecting and understanding those roots, you know, and those roots could be anything from, uh, you know, some of the, the garage band sounds of 65, 66, or it could be rockabilly from the 50s, X from Los Angeles. Of course, I always appreciated the cramps. Or it could be, you know, Hank Williams or Johnny Cash. You know, it could be any of that kind of stuff that you're bringing, bringing to a simplicity and a more directness. The music is just, for me, it just plays in my head, you know, so it plays in your head and then you just kind of, okay, try to work it out on an instrument and then boom, there it is. Maybe, you know, for us, maybe for me, it's just, you know, it's my personality. If you're in the mood to rock, stick around because we have a performance from Cinecide's latest album at the end of the show. From punk rock to jazz, world famous musician Wynton Marsalis is a phenom. He had a four-day residency at Detroit's Symphony Orchestra. The performances included Marsalis, accompanied by the Jazz at the Lincoln Center Orchestra, 
They hadn't performed live in person as an orchestra since March 2020. WRCJ's Linda Yawn talked to Marcellus before the four-day residency. May I say, Mr. Wynton Marcellus, that Detroit loves you madly. Oh, thank you, Linda. It's, it's great to see you and to talk to you. And you know, I love Detroit. There's so many great musicians uh, come from there, and I had so many great experiences. I always remember the great Marcus Belgrade. And uh, all that he contributed. Roy Brooks, I mean, so many, so many great, great musicians. <laughs> So you're coming to Detroit. You'll be part of a big residency at the DSO. And I'll just mention it right up front. Kaysan Belgrave's going to be in that band. That's right. Oh, Kassan. <laughs> Kassan, Kassan is playing with us. <laughs> I love him. It's like having one of your grandkids or your kid play with you. So <laughs> we're looking for his guy who gets this. It's some hard parts to play too, that prelude fugues and riffs. That's a difficult saxophone part. Mm -hmm. Well, he's got it. He's, he's got it. <laughs> so um, when you come to Detroit and it will be a residency at the DSO for four days, as I understand, will you be focusing mostly on the democracy suite? No, we're playing, um, we're playing a Stravinsky Ebony Concerto. <laughs> Prelude, Fugue, and Riffs, Bernstein. They're going to be playing a piece that I wrote called Blues Symphony. We're doing a Jazz for Young People's concert. The great Anthony McGill is playing the clarinet solo, so you got to check him out. He's unbelievable. We're doing different educational activities with the DSO Civic Youth Ensemble, and we're, uh, we're just going to be in the house playing. We're going to do a, a, a concert just with the band of, of uh, different music that we play with the theme of freedom. We might play some of the Democracy Suite also. Now, I know people can go to your website, Winton, and they can hear you talk about it, but I think it's important. And can you talk about the Democracy Suite for Detroit? Well, it has eight movements, and each movement is a, is, is, it, it looks at the things we've experienced in this time, and it uses the language of jazz, it's, it's all, um, it's, it's all instrumental, there are no words. But everything from just the determination and resolve it takes for people who are healthcare workers to do their job, to the presentness of people who are involved in protests, even though we're in a pandemic, risking their health and putting uh, their social concerns above, the, above their own safety in some instances, to the loss of, of loved ones in this time that you don't get a chance to visit with and sit with, to Black Lives Matter, the slogan, uh, that everybody has heard and knows different things that it, it uh, signifies too. The period before the election, when mailboxes were bouncing away, like, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> your postmaster general is making your mailbox disappear. So I look, see the irony and the humor in that, to the feeling of people just out in the street, getting down, doing their thing, the different types of parade, music and that kind of human will to find a groove, no matter how bad the circumstance is. And uh, that's, that's, a, that's a few of the movements and there, there are others. We've said this at Detroit Jazz Festivals, and it bears uh, repeating, is that the Detroit audience knows the music. And so you can't come play in lane. You cannot, uh, you, you know, phone it in in Detroit. You've got to be real. You know, I, I played it, it uh, the first time I played in, in Detroit was with Art Blakey. And um, it was for like two weeks. And um, it, it just, it's so many, so many people knowledgeable about the music. And you know, it does not forget Mac Avenue Records too, coming out of Detroit. I mean, Detroit is, yeah. We, we uh, you, you know, that's, yeah. Gre Gretchen is for real, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. they've, they've kept the vibe uh, going and the belief in the music in a time when commercialism has, has taken over now is so celebrated that uh, that type of integrity is something we have to always make sure we give special note to. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. Because you know, if we don't, we'll look up and it will it will actually finally be gone. It's like, can you cut every tree down? Eventually, yeah, you can. Well, welcome back to the city. I understand that this appearance in Detroit, this residency, is actually the first time that you're going to be back on the road <laughs> since the pandemic right. started. What what a way to start! Yeah, the whole the whole ensemble. Yes, the it's whole be, ensemble. Yeah, we're gonna be. We're gonna let's see. We we're gonna be. <laughs> let's see how we deal with it. <laughs> we're ready. <laughs> we, we're ready to do it. So. Well, oh, I know you are. And it, how good will it feel to be, you know, not working with just the septet, but with, you know, with kids, with students in person? How good is that going to feel to you? Yeah. So it's, you know, the pandemic, if it hasn't done anything, it's made us appreciate the lives we had. So it's going to, it's going to be, uh, it's not, not describable, but we we look forward to it. You know, we can't, it's hard to get fine words for it. You can learn more about upcoming jazz performances at the DSO on OneDetroitPBS.org. This next story is from one of our partners here at Detroit Public Television, the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. Penny Stamps director, Christina Hamilton, talks about the wide variety of speakers they had lined up back in the spring of 2021, from spatial video artists to industry-leading investigative journalists. Hamilton tells us who she was most excited to see and how the Penny Stamps digital series is here to stay. Here's One Detroit's Will Glover with more. The spring lineup is here. Uh, it's underway, so as expected, it's very impressive. Tell us a little bit about who we can expect to see and what's available for us to check out right now. This week, folks should join us uh, Friday for Jad Abumrad, who is, uh, most folks will know him from Radio Lab. Uh, and a lot of folks also hopefully have heard his amazing podcast, uh, Dolly Parton's America, which won a Peabody last year. Uh, you know, anybody, anybody that's missed anything should know that our archive is available online. So, uh, you know, for example, if you missed the Henry Louis Gates program, uh, you can go back and watch it. It's there for you. You didn't miss it. Uh, another exciting PBS persona that we'll be hosting uh, in April is Rainey Aronson, who is the, uh, you know, you know, the, the fearless uh, producer director behind the show Frontline, uh, which is certainly, you know, talk about, you know, cutting the edge uh, of, of America. You know, she's certainly doing an amazing job of that. So we can't wait to visit with Rainey. Um, and we've got, you know, some new program that we have, a new, a new program that we have not yet announced. So tell us will, about I have to tell you, you you're, you're, you're the first to hear the news. Uh, we are adding for our, uh, the week after rainy in April, this will be a program will be on April 9th, a program which will be a conversation between Wynton Marsalis and uh, Ken Fisher, uh, who is the director or was the director for 30 years of the University Musical Society. Um, and that will be, that will be, a, I, I am sure, another not to miss uh, uh, moment. Are there any plans to start thinking about what this is going to look like in the future as we get back to in-person? How that's gonna work out seems to shift constantly. I think it was last night, uh, I heard President Biden saying he thought by Christmas, things, you know, which was <laughs> not <laughs> what we all, we were all hoping I think for a lot sooner than that. Yeah. You know, I am trying to think about how, you know, to, because obviously I'm right now trying to think about our fall programming and how we're going to roll that out. Uh, without having any definitive on that, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think about it in some way that we can have be able to pivot somewhat to a more in-person format uh, before we would even, you know, I think there are a lot of challenges around that too, right, though, because what happens to travel? I can't imagine international borders are going to be uh, open as soon as perhaps we might be able to get together in the theater again. Like, you know, we used to always think of ourselves as a live first uh, um, production, and I think that has forever changed now. You know, we will certainly be continuing uh, to make work for our, you know, our online audiences. 
but we also really, really, really want to get back to those in-person engagements, you know, because it's, it's so much, you know, much, there's more sort of engagement and conversation that happens in real time around these folks when we can have them in person. I think we're also going to see some of that too, though, where we will have people who cannot travel here that we still want to engage where we may have more of a digital platform in the theater for people in person to be engaging around as well. So, you know, I'm trying to think about it and keep, keep an open mind for the path forward. Who are you looking forward to most? There's always, there's always a difficult question and that is going to be it for you. Who are you most excited to see? <laughs> oh God, that's a really hard question for me because, you know, they're kind of like, it's there's there so many ways I, I look forward to each and every one of them right because um everybody has something exceptional to offer how I have to say though if I if I had to only pick one which is almost impossible but I am very 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 excited about uh Pippilotti Wrist uh this is uh she's is a video artist um from Switzerland who is exceptional this woman is absolutely exceptional a couple of the reasons that I would put her at the forefront of my list are A, she is really, really, really thinking about this space that you and I are in right now and how we're communicating and how we're all in these, we've all been sort of flattened out into this two dimensional, you know, screen space. This is what her work is all about and how, you know, how does the physical body, you know, um, live in this sort of 2D environment? With that, where can, people go to get that surprise, to get the insight and knowledge that is provided by the Penny Stamp series? Uh, you know, we, we, we put things out through YouTube, through Facebook, PBS Books is our partner. Um, so this, you know, different libraries are, are offering this, um, at the Detroit Public Television website, and then pennystampsevents.org is sort of where, uh, you know, our, our homepage, where you can find all the information on everybody. Uh, and all programs are released Friday nights at 8 p.m. Uh, and then are available, you know, in our archive uh, after that for on-demand viewing. The Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series will webcast all of their events on Fridays at 8 p.m. at dptv.org. You can also watch and join the Penny Stamps Conversation live on their Facebook page. That's it for me, but we leave you with a performance from Cinecide. This song is called Vegetable or Thing from their album of the same name. Enjoy, and I'll see you next week.
Support for this program provided in part by the Kresge Foundation, the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Gregory Haynes and Richard Soninklar, Nissan Foundation, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.